Welcome to Congressman Rob Woodall's Telephone Town Hall, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. To ask a question during the Q&A session, press star 1. In an effort to accommodate as many callers' questions as possible, we ask that you limit your questions and comments to 60 seconds. Those callers who exceed the 60-second mark will be muted. Additionally, this call hosts families from around the district, and we ask that callers keep their comments family-friendly. Please know this call is being recorded, so if you need to hang up early, the call will be available at a later date. Now I will turn the call over to Congressman Woodall. You may begin. Well, good evening. I sure do appreciate everybody joining uh, me tonight. This is the very first town hall meeting over the telephone uh, that I've hosted in my very uh, short uh, tenure. We've done a, uh, a number of uh, in-person uh, town halls, which I always enjoy, uh, but I've talked to a lot of folks who say they just can't get out uh, to those for a variety of reasons, and so I want to make sure that we have some other uh, opportunities for folks to uh, get involved and, and have some of that give and take. Uh, what has this call on my mind uh, tonight and, and why I so appreciate uh, you all joining me, uh, is the budget. Uh, every time you open up the newspaper, you see something about the numbers coming out of Washington, D.C., but we have so many different things going on in Washington, D.C. When I end up talking to folks about uh, what their uh, desires are, what they think the right uh, direction to go is, I often hear people confusing a number of the different things that we have going on and, and thinking they're the same thing. So I, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes uh, here early uh, to talk about the four different things that we have on our plate uh, in Washington uh, and then get right into uh, some of the questions and the comments that uh, that you all uh, uh, might have. It's, there is uh, a lot that we argue about in terms of policy, what the right direction is to go, but there's even more that, that we argue about in terms of uh, strategy. Uh, we know where we're going, but what's the best way to get there? Uh, and so as we get into some of these budget uh, debates, uh, we're going to have uh, debates both on policy and on strategy. The four things that we have going on right now, we have last year's annual budget. That's what we end up seeing as this continuing resolution that keeps coming up over and over again. That's a bill that should have been passed last year, but they had a, uh, couldn't get agreement uh, amongst themselves last year, so it got dumped over into this year. And all it's going to do at this stage of the game is fund the government from today through the end of September, uh, what is fiscal year uh, 2011. So these continuing resolutions that we uh, keep dealing with, that's the 2011 annual budget. You're beginning to see conversation about the 2012 annual budget. That's the second thing uh, that we talk about. That funds the government from uh, October 1st. Uh, of uh, this year uh, through September of next year. And had the Congress last year gotten the job done, we wouldn't be focused on last year at all. And what would happen during uh, in this time of the year, the March, April, May time, is we'd be focused exclusively on uh, trying to get the 2012 uh, budget passed. Uh, and so that process is beginning, and you'll hear about that. You're also hearing about the debt limit. Uh, the debt limit uh, has nothing to do with the annual appropriations bills going forward, but it's a reflection of how much we've spent going backwards. Uh, we're expected to hit that statutory cap. Uh, the, the debt limit is the statutory cap on how much money the federal government's allowed to borrow. We're expected to hit that cap sometime between early April and early June. Uh, and it has absolutely nothing to do with decisions we've made this Congress about how to spend going forward, but it's just the, the credit card uh, that has been run up in past Congresses. And so we've got to make that uh, decision. Uh, what do we do when we reach that uh, limit, and where do we go uh, from there? So the debt limit is the third big budget item that's on our, our plate. And the final uh, budget item uh, is arguably the, the one that uh, – uh, that matters uh, most. It's the biggest numbers that we deal with, and it's the 10-year uh, budget that Congress passes. Uh, Congress passes a 10-year budget. The president uh, suggests a 10-year budget, 
uh, and then uh, folks get together and, and try to agree on something between the House and the and the Senate about what to do going forward. It was back in February that President Obama introduced uh, his uh, 10-year budget, and uh, he was attacked from the left as saying he did too much, uh, and certainly uh, my criticism uh, was that he didn't do nearly enough, and, and so that's the uh, that's the challenge uh, that he faces. We are now getting ready to introduce a congressional budget uh, in April, and that's one of the things I was hoping you all would, uh, would give me some guidance and feedback on uh, tonight. If you look at the president's uh, 10-year budget, uh, he expects to run up about $7 trillion more dollars in debt. We have about $14 trillion in debt right now. He anticipates running up another uh, seven, increasing that by 50 percent over the next uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, he anticipates taxes, which traditionally taxes in this country are about 18 percent of of GDP. Right now, they're at a, a historical low level. They're down about 14 percent of GDP. The president uh, anticipates running them up uh, to a, a historically high level of about 22 percent uh, of GDP. So he's got a big tax component in his budget. Uh, he also has a big spending uh, component in his budget. In this time where uh, we think we don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem in Washington, uh, he still has some spending priorities that he wants to, uh, wants to focus on, and uh, he's included those uh, in his budget. What he never does in his budget is tackle what I'll call uh, the big three. Uh, he doesn't tackle any mandatory spending issues. Uh, in fact, he tries to move more things into the mandatory spending category. Let me talk just a second about what that what that is. I, I know I've heard from a lot of folks who are frustrated that we're spending so much time in Washington uh, arguing about uh, the little things, which in in Washington parlance, the little things are things like the six billion dollars that the that the CR cut. Now, it, it says something about how spending is out of control. Uh, that six billion dollars uh, is suddenly small money. Uh, six billion dollars is about a third of the budget uh, of the great state of Georgia. Uh, but in uh, Washington, uh, they just consider it pocket change, uh, and that leads to a lot of really bad decisions coming out of, uh, coming out of there. Uh, but when we do these annual appropriations bills, the law only allows us to deal with what's called the discretionary part of the budget. There are two parts of the budget, disc- uh, two parts of annual spending, discretionary and mandatory. Discretionary are those things we make decisions about. Uh, should we uh, fund uh, transportation? Uh, should we build a bridge? Uh, should we not? Should we uh, get involved in this education issue? Should we not? Mandatory spending are things that happen automatically if you meet the criteria. If you turn 65 and you show up for Medicare benefits, you're going to get them. Congress doesn't have to decide you get them that year. You get them automatically. If you go and apply for food stamps and you meet the income criteria, you're going to get those food stamps automatically. We don't go and look to see if there's enough money to pay for them. We don't go and decide whether or not we're going to uh, uh, fund that. You get it automatically. That's what we call mandatory uh, spending. It's it's true of Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security, a number of veterans uh, benefits programs, and, and so on and so on. That's where the big money is uh, in the budget. If you look at at what happens over over time, and there's some great charts about this. It's tough to, it's tough to share those on the telephone. But the big drivers of our debt going forward are our health care costs, primarily Medicare costs. Um, states uh, share Medicaid costs with the federal government. Uh, the federal government picks up all of the of the Medicare costs. So it's primarily Medicare costs that drive the federal model. And, and the reason that is, is because particularly after the passage of Obamacare last year, when they worked to abolish the entire Medicare Advantage program, which tried to allow Medicare beneficiaries to get into some new and different health care models, Medicare is the exact same health care model it was back in 1965, which is that uh, fee-for-service, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, uh, 80-20 uh, uh, split with with copays uh, model, uh, and that was a wonderful model in 1965. Uh, but we've come a long way uh, since then. What we're working on on the budget committee uh, right now is offering an alternative to the president's 10-year budget proposal. 
and we want to get to balance. You may remember, uh, as I do, back in the uh, in the first George Bush days, even the second George Bush days, certainly the Clinton days, if someone offered to get the budget to balance over 10 years, we thought they were weak, didn't think they were working hard enough, wondered why they didn't take it seriously and get it done in two or three years. We are so far out of whack today, and we've just gotten that way over the past three years. We've moved from having a $300 billion annual deficit to a $1.5 trillion annual deficit. It got five times worse on a year-over-year basis just over the past three years. It is a real it is a real uh, big lift to get to a balanced budget over 10 years. And candidly, I don't know if we're going to be able to, to do it. It's going to depend on the American people and, and how much uh, uh, shared pain and sacrifice folks are willing to uh, to get involved in. And, I, and I, I'll use this as an example, and then we'll go straight to, uh, straight to questions. You hear people say a lot, and, and they say it from the heart, that when we talk about changing the entitlement programs, we are not going to change the program for people who are age 55 or over. Now, I'm a big believer uh, that you can't pull the rug out from under people that you've made promises to. Uh, poverty isn't about how much money you have in your pocket today. It's about how many choices you get to make about your life tomorrow. And if you've already retired, you are run out of those choices. The government made promises to you. It needs to come through and, and keep those commitments. But if we say we're not going to change the rules from anybody over uh, over age 55, that's exactly what Speaker of the House John Boehner has said, uh, that we're going to work with my generation and those younger to renegotiate the promises of the federal government. You have to understand that we've then grandfathered the entire baby boom generation. Right, The first of the baby boomers uh, were uh, retiring uh, last year. Those born in 1945 were uh, we're retiring in 2010. Uh, now, 10 years from now, it's going to have everybody born between 1945 and 1955 in the group of people that we're not going to change the plan for. If you do that, you don't have any other triggers that you can pull. Since, since the biggest part of the budget are these big entitlement programs, if you grandfather everybody into those entitlement programs over the next 10 years, it's really hard uh, to cut costs over the next 10 years because you're only left with that very small part of the pie that is discretionary uh, spending. And to put that in in perspective, about 60% of the budget is mandatory spending, and about 40% is this discretionary spending that we have some uh, some annual control over. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, we're going to be, we, we have been working and will continue to work uh, in the Budget Committee each and every day uh, to uh, try to put together a proposal uh, that will make you proud, uh, that will do the kind of heavy lifting uh, that I believe uh, you sent me to Washington uh, to do for you, that will make the kind of tough decisions uh, that you want uh, to be made. Uh, and I hope that you'll give me some, some feedback on what you're hearing and tell me what it is that you need a little bit of clarity on, and, and we'll get together again uh, certainly before the, uh, the budget uh, is released. Uh, but it's going to require a team effort uh, to get this done. It's going to require us all uh, to be on board and and pushing in the same direction, because if there were easy decisions to be made, they've been made already. The only ones that are left for you and me to make are the hard decisions uh, that are going to be uh, painful today, but are going to reap huge, huge benefits for our economy uh, and for our future generations uh, tomorrow. Uh, and with that, like I said, I thank you again for, for joining me tonight, and let's, let's go to the first question. Our first question is from Jeanette Bruns. Your line is open. Hi, Jeanette. Jeanette, are you with us this evening? I know your opinion on the comparative effectiveness research, a stimulus-funded program. Um, I guess I wanted to know if you were aware that a similar program exists in the Washington State known as the Health Technology Assessment Program and they are currently debating the need for glucose monitoring for children under 18. The board claims that the effect effectiveness and an optimal frequency of self-monitoring of blood glucose in patients is controversial. They have obviously not raised a diabetic child. I have. So at what point do we decide that government and not doctors should decide the type of care patients receive? Do you agree with this approach? 
the Jeanette, you've hit the nail right on the head. You know, whenever we end up providing a government benefit, we face exactly this choice. It, whatever the government benefit is that, that I'm working on in Washington, D.C., there are going to be taxpayers on one hand who want to pay less for that benefit because we're paying for it out of their pocket. And then there are going to be people who receive the benefit on the other hand who want it to be the maximum uh, benefit that they can get. So I absolutely uh, support uh, working with each and every one of these federal health care programs to try to make sure that they're making the best decisions that they can. I do not support the the ability of a competitive uh, a comparative effectiveness panel to make decisions for us. The solution for me and 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 I hope some of you will will agree with me about it. We'll be able to talk about it more certainly in the in the future is putting these health care decisions and the dollars associated with them back into your pockets and your control. It's outrageous that as Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, folks have to come and beg their congressmen to keep their benefits uh, in those areas that they need them most. Because if the dollars were yours, if, if you were making your own health care choices, you would put the benefits in place where you need them most. Do we need the information out there that these comparative effectiveness panels provide? I think the answer is, is yes. It's incredibly difficult to get good health care information. My doctor recommended to me uh, that I go get a CAT scan on my heart. Uh, well, I've been calling around, and I can't get anybody to tell me what the actual price of a CAT scan is because I want to go to the cheapest one I can find. Uh, but folks, they don't want to talk about their prices. They don't want to talk about what my insurance company, Aetna, you know, what their discounted negotiated rate is. It's incredibly difficult for me as someone who, uh, who has access to lots of information and who loves to shop around for prices. Even I can't find the information that I need to make those decisions well. So we do need to get more information out there. But at the end of the day, health care decisions have to be between patients and doctors. Patients and doctors are the only place health care decisions can lie. And I believe if we move in that direction, that we will see a cost savings as well. The fact that there are third-party intermediaries in each and every one of our health care decisions not only drain dollars from the system, but I think causes each to make decisions that we would not have made otherwise uh, had we been left to, uh, left that decision to, to us and our doctors. Let's get that next question. Our next question comes from Isaac Reed. Your line is open. Uh, the Democratic Party has shown in Wisconsin, as well as Indiana, Ohio, and some other states, that they are looking after uh, the middleman, the common people. What do you think that the Republican Party is doing to prove to us that they're looking after our best interests? The, Isaac, I, I think you hit uh, the nail right on the head, uh, too, and, and you said it in two parts. Uh, uh, one, you said looking out for your, your best interests. And the other time you said provide uh, for the, the uh, uh, middle class families, working class families. I, the Republican Party is not doing anything to provide anything except freedom. Uh, and, and that's important. Uh, and, and that's why it's so tough for Republicans to get their messaging right. Because what my message is over and over and over again is count on me to protect your freedom so that you can make the very best choices you can about your life. It is absolutely true that the Democratic Party wants to take care of middle-class America. And, and by taking care of them, that means making decisions on their behalf. I'll give you an example. Uh, my health care uh, uh, plan was abolished under Obamacare. I had a medical savings account plan because it was the cheapest plan I could find, and I'm a, I'm a thrifty shopper. And the president. Uh, bill, it was actually Nancy Pelosi's bill, but, but the Obamacare legislation said, no, I'm sorry, Rob, your plan doesn't provide you with enough. And if you were smarter, you'd get a plan that provided you with more free stuff. Now, you have to pay extra for more free stuff, uh, but you'd have more stuff. So my plan, which was very cheap and that I liked a lot, is now gone, and I now have a more expensive plan that provides me with things that I don't want or need. Uh, Absolutely, the Democrats are going to work harder to take care of America and make decisions for them. 
I'm going to work hard and Republicans are going to work hard to bring freedom back to America so folks will make decisions for themselves. I cannot, I just can't, and government can't, make decisions that will make everybody in America wealthy. We can absolutely make decisions in Washington that will make everybody in America poor. And I'm concerned that that's the direction we're headed uh, with some of these uh, policies. For me, uh, freedom will always be paramount because I know if we leave those decisions to you, Isaac, you will always make better decisions for yourself than I'll be able to make on your behalf. Um, let's get the next question. Bill Thompson, your line is open. Bill, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I have a, a quick comment and then a question. First, I, I certainly agree with uh, moving toward a balanced budget and containing costs and uh, cutting where we can, including the Defense Department, which I think is terribly bloated. But uh, I just don't think it's feasible to balance the budget with cuts alone. I think it, you've got to also increase income and place a fair tax on the wealthiest 2% and closing corporate loopholes that allow huge corporations like Exxon to pay no taxes. For example, Google earned $11 billion last year overseas and paid 4.2% in taxes. So I think a fair tax on the wealthy and those who can chip in a little more has to be part of the budget uh, picture. Yeah. Bill, I absolutely agree with you that you can't do it on spending cuts alone. Now, we may disagree on how it is we get to that, uh, that taxation uh, place. Right now, uh, tax revenue in this country is about 14.5% of GDP. It's usually up around 18%, but the economy is in turmoil, and folks aren't making any money. And if they're not making any money, they can't send in uh, any money. Uh, and that has brought revenues down, and that's exacerbated our annual budget uh, deficits. We have to get the economy moving in a way that brings more taxpayers back to the rolls. Now, you talk about raising uh, taxes. I'll tell you I'm not a fan of class warfare. Uh, you know, the only people that have ever given me a job in my life uh, are rich people. I've never had a poor man uh, offer me a job. And, and the reason is because I've been a poor man and I didn't have a job to offer. Only folks with resources and ideas are out there providing the jobs. So why, when we have record high unemployment rates, we'd want to raise taxes on those folks who are providing the jobs, uh, it, that's confusing uh, to me. I want to make sure that we're focused on, on getting those jobs uh, up and going. That said, I agree with you 100% about corporate loopholes. You know, I've introduced H.R. 25, uh, the fair tax, and that is the only bill in Congress that abolishes every single corporate loophole in the entire income tax system. Every single giveaway, every lobbyist-funded uh, special exception in favor, every single one of them, uh, because it abolishes uh, corporate income taxes altogether. I don't believe that corporations pay taxes. There's no secret drawer where they can collect the money to pay taxes. They have to get it either out of the price of their product, which you and I pay when we're consumers, out of their employees' wages, which their employees are paying, uh, or uh, out of their stockholders, uh, which, again, the, the economy is paying. But at the end of the day, it's going to be one of us, one of us individuals that pays every nickel in corporate taxes. I want us to get corporate taxes as low as we possibly can in this country. We have the highest corporate tax rates in the world, which means businesses don't want to be here. They don't want to provide jobs here because they're going to get taxed here ways they wouldn't be taxed elsewhere. Before uh, Chrysler Daimler, or before, before Chrysler became Daimler Chrysler, it came to Congress and testified in front of the, the tax writing committee and said, we want to stay in Detroit, but taxes are so high here, if you don't make changes, we're going to have to move to Germany. And Congress said, forget it, we're not going to make any changes. And so Chrysler became Daimler Chrysler and moved their headquarters from Detroit to Stuttgart. We have to keep those American businesses here, and we have to attract new businesses to our shores. The way to do that is with the lowest corporate tax rate that we can get to make sure that folks want to come here. And, and to be clear, corporate taxes provide about one out of every $10 uh, in federal revenue. Uh, 
uh, you and I, again, we pay the taxes. We pay the income taxes and we pay it in payroll uh, taxes. The corporate tax costs as much to comply with as it does uh, remit to the federal government. It's a huge drain uh, on our economy, not to mention it raises all of those fairness issues uh, that you raise, and we, and we absolutely have to deal with those. And, and finally, uh, Bill, to your, to your Defense Department uh, point, uh, I agree with you. Uh, nothing can escape scrutiny as we're making these uh, decisions. So you don't get a free pass just because you're a program that we like. Uh, everybody has to be a part of the solution. I have already voted uh, to make cuts in the Defense Department, and I will vote uh, again in the future to make cuts uh, in the Defense Department. Now, are there smart cuts and, and dumb cuts? Yes, there are. And I'm trying to make sure we make the smartest uh, cuts that we can, but we all have to be participants. Every line item in the federal budget needs to be a participant uh, in getting this country back on track, and we as taxpayers will be participants uh, too as the economy starts to grow again. Uh, operator, let's get the next question. David Smith, your line is open. Congressman Well. Hi, David. Hey, how are you tonight? Fantastic. Uh, you've uh, touched on one point that I had a question about, and one of it is the fair tax. And I've got one other uh, concern of mine. Fair tax, uh, how soon do you think, uh, if any uh, time frame is available, that we would have that? Uh, because I, I certainly support it. I, I believe everybody in this country should be paying their fair taxes. I'd rather be taxed on what I spend and not what taxed on what I make. The other thing that I have a concern about is uh, this morning I had to, uh, like everybody else, stop and get gas at my local quick trip and paying $33.34 a gallon. When I came home this afternoon, it was three forty-five. How soon or is there any movement in Washington other than the Pickens plan to get us off of foreign oil? And the reason I say this, I spent a year in Saudi Arabia from 73 to 74. Um, I'm a veteran. And we're sending a lot of money over there to fund a lot of folks with Cadillacs and Mercedes that uh, that really I don't believe have our best interest at hand. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, let me take those. Uh, let me take the energy question uh, first because you, you finished uh, with that one. Uh, you know, we developed the Department of Energy. Uh, President Jimmy Carter, our own uh, Georgia son, uh, developed the Department of Energy uh, for the sole purpose of eliminating our dependence as Americans on foreign oil. Uh, and we didn't get that done. Uh, it's been 30 years, and we hadn't gotten that, uh, hadn't gotten that done. And it's not that we can't get it done. It's that we don't have the political will to get it done. Do you remember back in 1996? We had this debate with President Clinton, and President Clinton, we, we, we were talking about drilling uh, and trying to get more uh, American resources into the market, and the President said in 1996, it'll take 10 years to get that oil out of the ground. It's not even worth talking about that because we need solutions today. Well, here we are 15 years uh, later, and we still haven't uh, gotten that done. Have you followed the plight of Seahawk uh, drilling? Uh, Seahawk is a is a shallow water driller. Uh, they and their and their parent company, another American drilling uh, company, uh, uh, well, filed for bankruptcy in February because we can't get permits through the EPA and through the Interior uh, Department to do drilling. So we have American drillers, American-owned companies with American labor, ready to drill for American oil to reduce American energy prices. And they're going out of business during a time of record oil prices because the government won't give them the permits that they need to drill. I say to my friends who are on the environmental side of the uh, uh, fancy themselves environmentalists, as a Southerner, I take a back seat to no one on environmental issues. We are out there hunting and fishing and hiking and biking and playing uh, in ways that the rest of the nation can't because we've got such a wonderful climate and such wonderful uh, God-given resources here in our part of the our part of the world, but there is not a nation on the planet that has a lousy economy and a successful environmental program. Not one. And what this administration is doing is crippling our economy in the name of tipping its hat to environment to the environmental lobby, and it is a lose 
lose. We need win-wins to get ourselves out of this economic collapse. We need win-wins uh, to get ourselves uh, to be non-dependent on, uh, on foreign oil. We have more energy resources in America than we can consume over hundreds of years. We only need the political will to implement those. Uh, Anwar is the, is the easiest and fastest location to access as it's already close to a, uh, to a pipeline in, uh, in Alaska. Uh, we can make those decisions. We need the political will to make those decisions. Uh, we have a drill here, drill now bill that is coming back through Congress. I have no expectation that the president's going to sign it. I can only hope that, president, or that uh, Harry Reid in the Senate is going to move it. But I'm absolutely certain it's going to become an issue in the next presidential campaign because this is a, it's a national security issue and an economics issue that we have distinct disagreements about in the two political parties. Now, that takes us to fair tax. The realistic time frame for the fair tax is 2013. We need a presidential candidate who is running on the fair tax, who believes in the fair tax, to win on the fair tax issue and lead from that bully pulpit in Washington to make it happen. Uh, Congress has an incredibly strong support uh, for the fair tax. We added two more uh, co-sponsors this month, including a member of the, of the House Ways and Means Committee, which is the committee that writes all tax legislation. Uh, we are going to have more support in the House representatives than we've ever had before, and we already have five United States senators on board uh, this cycle. But a national issue like this that's so big, even though it's the grassroots in America that's actually leading on this issue, we need the grassroots to lead the president in the same way that they're leading the Congress. And if you look at the success that the grassroots movement has had with Congress, I promise you they can have that same success with a presidential nominee. In fact, Mike Huckabee would say uh, that the fair tax was the reason he won Iowa uh, last year, that it was, it was folks who understood the fair tax and believed in the fair tax who came out and, and participated in the, in the Iowa caucuses and, and, and got him started uh, on his uh, series of, of, uh, of presidential uh, victories last, uh, last time around. I think we will have not one but two or three folks on the Republican side of the aisle run on the fair tax platform this time. Of course, last cycle we had a Democrat, a former United States uh, senator, uh, run on the Democratic side of the aisle on the fair tax platform. I don't expect any Democrats will challenge President Obama here in his, uh, as he approaches his second uh, term, but I know he's going to get a fair tax challenge uh, from the Republican side. And if we can make that uh, happen, it's 2013 that we can make the fair tax a reality. Operator, what's the next question? Ron. Edelman, your line is open. Good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Yes, sir. Uh, earlier today on Glenn Beck's radio program, he revealed how the left forum held recently at uh, Pace University was strategizing how to subvert and sabotage our economic stability to start their own movement. Could you comment on that, please? Well, to tell you the truth, Ron, I didn't see uh, Glenn today, and so I don't know uh, a lot about that group uh, or their views. I will tell you that we're in a precarious, a precarious economic state, and and if you, if folks are serious about bringing America down, you don't need to bomb us. You need to meddle in our economy, and that's exactly what's going on. Uh, we are making a series of choices. Uh, now that are going to have far, far-reaching uh, economic ramifications. Uh, the, the debt is the easiest uh, one of those. By, by 2020, it's expected, if we continue at our current pace, that interest on the national debt will be the single largest line item in the budget. Not education, not national defense, not transportation. Interest on the debt, single largest line item in the in the budget. And folks, this is at record low interest rates. I mean, here's the big secret. I think Glenn talked about this a, a few weeks ago. You remember when the mortgage crisis uh, started coming on and they said, well, it's because we sucked everybody into home buying at these really low teaser rates. And then as soon as rates uh, went up a little bit, folks weren't able to uh, make their mortgage payments. 
Well, America has been sucked into this debt at teaser rates. Forty-four percent of all the, the borrowing that America has done comes due in the next 52 weeks. Forty-four percent comes due in the next 52 weeks. And we're not doing a lot to change uh, those ratios. So as it comes due, we end up borrowing more short-term money to pay back the short-term money that we've already borrowed, even though we know we have a long-term need for that money. But folks don't want to sell us that long-term uh, uh, debt. We're, we're, it, would, it would reflect poorly uh, in the budget for the politicians uh, if they went after an, uh, that long-term debt to get that, that stability. Economic collapse took the Soviet Union in 18 months. In 18 months, they went from superpower to no power with an economic collapse. And if you think for a minute that can't happen to America, you're mistaken. We are already seeing uh, PIMCO bond funds, for example, uh, PIMCO uh, mutual funds, just dumped all of their government treasury bonds, sold them all. They said for the kind of risk that we're taking, buying American debt, we're not making nearly enough money. So we're getting out of the American debt uh, business. Uh, Japan is going to be buying a lot less U.S. debt going forward because it's got issues of its own there that it's going to be spending its, uh, its resources on. The largest debt holder on the planet is no longer the Chinese. It used to be the Japanese. The Chinese took over from the Japanese. It's now the Federal Reserve because we can't find enough people on the planet to buy our debt we have to print extra money in the basement and come buy our own debt. And we're doing that kind of funny bookkeeping where the Federal Reserve gets to print some money and then bring it out and buy debt with it and claim that that was somebody uh, purchasing our debt, when really it was just us financing our debt uh, with the newly printed money. It is a frightening, frightening time. And I tell you, I know we can get through it and come out on the other side. I know that we can. We are a, we are a nation that does spectacular things in times of crisis. The question is, do folks understand, as you're suggesting, Ron, that this really is that time of crisis, that we really are at one of those turning points in American history, and if we make the right choices, we will go back to that time of the city uh, shining on the hill. And if we make the wrong choices, uh, we may well go the way uh, of the Soviet Union. And it's your and my job, because we're different here in Georgia. We're different here in the 7th District. We can make the tough choices that other folks in America might be afraid to make. Uh, and so I do believe, and I don't, I don't say this frivolously, I believe that America is counting on us and like-minded folks across, uh, across this country to stand up and make the tough decisions that get this country back on track. Operator, what's the next question? David Skeel, your line is open. Uh, yes, Mr. Woodall, good evening. Good evening, Mr. School. How are you tonight? Fantastic. Good. Hey, look, two quick comments. Number one, I had emailed you the uh, a link to the uh, Blaze article that the gentleman before me referred to regarding the uh, economic terrorism. Uh, so you'll have that in your office. Thank and uh, number two, I am one of the grassroots uh, uh, fighters for the fair tax. I'm wearing a fair tax hat right now, and I've got a sign in my front yard. So uh, keep on pushing. That's a great plan. Uh, I kind of like the macro versus micro uh, approach, and our problems are so big. I think that uh, there's really two things already in play that we can look at, and I want to find out what you think of both of them. Uh, Paul Ryan's roadmap to um, America uh, includes um, very deta detailed um, policy uh, proposals for entitlement reform, but the only thing I don't like about his reform is the VAT tax component of it. I want to get your take on uh, where you stand on supporting that because I think Mr. Ryan really has a good idea and it's time to make that the, that bold decision and really push that. And number two, uh, the GAO just recently re released a, a very critical report of redundancies in programs that amount to some three or four hundred billion dollars that can be corrected in a relatively short period of time. And I also want to get your take on that, because that seems to be kind of low-hanging fruit and in that discretionary area where you can have an impact quickly. Well, a couple of things on that, uh, Mr. Skill. Thank you first for your fair tax uh, support. If you believe for a second that the American people are not still running this country, you don't need to look anywhere past 
just a fair tax issue. It is a giant issue that came from outside of Washington, has taken over Washington because one voter at the time has demanded of their representatives that they come on board and be a supporter. And if we can continue, not just on the fair tax, but on decision after decision after decision to make sure the American people are running the show instead of insiders in Washington running the show, we will come out on the uh, on the better side of this issue. Uh, that GAO report that you mentioned is absolutely uh, low-hanging fruit, uh, and the committees that uh, control those programs are already at work trying to bring that legislation uh, to the floor. And you, you make an excellent point. When we cut something this year, when we make a program go away that's redundant, that's not doing its job, it's not as effective as, as some other programs are, it's not just this year that we experience the savings. It's year after year after year because the program's gone. It doesn't grow and it doesn't continue to waste money. Uh, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, that nonpartisan the office that, that scores all of the, the budget bills, said of the very first continuing uh, resolution, they said, we're going to score this at a, at a, a billion dollars in savings for this year, but we think it's going to save $40 billion over 10 years that that's the kind of multiplier effect you get going out into the future. So if we, the, the reason, it's so easy to kick the can down the road and say, uh, uh, we're going to be strong and implement something today, but it's not going to go into effect for, for five years. Well, that's not being strong. Uh, that's kicking the can down the road. We have made the decision that we're going to start with cuts immediately, that we're going to find those redundancies and inefficiencies immediately and go after them uh, right away, not wait for the next uh, next budget cycle, and that's going to have uh, huge implications uh, down the road uh, in terms of in terms of savings. Uh, Paul Ryan's roadmap is a fantastic place. If you hadn't looked at Paul Ryan's roadmap, he's my chairman. I sit on the budget uh, committee. Uh, he took a big risk and put out some very definitive ideas about where it is he would take this budget process and. And on the budget committee, we're kind of working from, from that as a, as a backdrop. But here's the thing, and, and if, you're, if, you, if you're trying to get your mind around how big a challenge America faces, uh, look at it through this lens. Paul Ryan is a true American patriot and a true leader. And he, in his roadmap for America, made tough, tough, tough decisions. Decisions that people have railed against as being draconian and mean-hearted and so on and so on. And he still doesn't get to a balanced budget for about 40 years. 40 years. Making tough, tough, tough decisions. It, it, it has gotten so bad that the Congressional Budget Office now doesn't release its budget scoring in terms of have we reached a balanced budget. It scores in terms of have we reached a balanced budget if we pretend we don't have to pay interest on the debt, so what they call primary balance. It's a nonsense uh, number. But the, but the problem is so big, folks were afraid to, to talk about it in, in, its, uh, in its totality. Uh, that's the conversation America is going to have to have over the next two months as we're going through this, this budget process, knowing that it's going to hurt more the more we do now and – uh, but yield larger benefits down the road, hurt less, the less we do now, but hurt us terribly uh, down the road, where is America going to come down on making some of these tough decisions? And, and if you're trying to make those decisions uh, for yourself, I absolutely uh, agree with uh, Mr. Skill. Take a look at the uh, at uh, Paul Ryan's uh, roadmap. You'll find that uh, on the uh, Budget Committee website and on Paul Ryan's uh, webpage, which is just uh, paulryan.house.gov. Operator, let's get one more question. Terry Ford, your line is open. Yes, thanks for taking my call, Representative Woodhall. Yes, sir. Uh, a federal judge issued a ruling that threatened the uh, the water supply to uh, all of Metro Atlanta. I was wondering what was your strategy to ensure that this area has an ad adequate water supply in the future. The Mr. Ford, if if the budget is the largest issue of facing the country, and I, I believe that it, that it is in terms of our survival, uh, that decision by Judge Magnuson is the, is the most important decision uh, regarding the survival of our community. Uh, Gwinnett County, uh, Forsyth County, uh, North Fulton 
cannot survive if that ruling stays in place. Uh, now, Governor Deal uh, is working very hard directly with the governors of Alabama and Florida in terms of, of getting some of these negotiations uh, going. And we passed legislation in Congress that delegated the authority to the governors to, to work it out amongst themselves. So we didn't have to pass a, a, a bill where one state wins and another state loses. We, we've given the states the authority to say, decide for yourself and try to find a win-win scenario. And the governor uh, just said uh, last uh, week, I believe it was, that uh, he's making great progress with Alabama and believes if he can put Al- find an agreement with Alabama, it's going to make it easier to get that next agreement with Florida. The uh, Judge Magnuson, in his ruling, gave us until July of next year uh, to sort this out amongst ourselves. Uh, at the federal level, uh, I'm pushing legislation that adds to the list of permitted uses of Lake Lanier, uh, water, uh, drinking supply uh, water for Gwinnett County. Uh, and if we can get that signed into law, uh, that will solve the, uh, the judge's uh, issue. Uh, there's also been an appeal of the judge's uh, issue, and uh, what he said is the law doesn't actually allow the Corps of Engineers to release this water for people to drink. You can, you can store it there to ski on, you can boat on it, you can use it for fishing, but the law doesn't actually say you can use it for drinking water. Uh, that's been an element of the appeal. Uh, the appellate judge who just heard the case the other day seemed very sympathetic uh, to the Corps' position that they're just in charge of water and they're trying to make the best decisions they can, and clearly drinking water for, for human beings is a, ought to be a priority uh, of theirs. Uh, so it may get sorted out in the appellate process in the courts, it may get sorted out among the state executive branch uh, agencies, or it may get sorted out uh, with Congress uh, with new legislation. We are working on all three of those because this is an issue that is absolutely too important uh, to fail on. The failure is not an option uh, for our community. We already lose businesses here today because they see water uncertainty in our future, and we absolutely have to clear that out of the way uh, and will uh, before this deadline of July uh, 2012 that the, that the Judge Magnuson has set down. Operator, one more question. Adam Brown. Hi. Good evening, Mr. Brown. Hi, how are you? Very well. Uh, my question is not really a question, it's more of a suggestion, and it's, it's a minor one. How would you feel about introducing legislation that requires all employees of each branch of government, legislative, executive, and uh, legislative, executive, and judicial, to take a pay cut based on the percentage increase of our national debt until it is resolved? Basically, basing the pay of all government employees in terms of making decisions on our national debt. The higher it goes, the less pay there is. The lower the debt until it's balanced, the higher it becomes. It wouldn't be drops in the bucket in terms of our national debt, I know, but it would be motivation for members of Congress especially to avoid legislation that increases spending and adding to our debt. And it would be a show of good faith to the American people that the government is serious about being fiscally responsible. That raises a lot of interesting questions, uh, Mr. Brown. Number one, I believe in those kinds of incentive programs. Well, we've seen it in healthcare. If you add a one dollar copay to a service that used to be free, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of what it does, uh, in terms of the dollars that come in, but it substantially changes utilization of those services. If people have to pay a dollar of their own, they think, golly, maybe I don't need that service as much as I thought that I did. Uh, And so they they don't utilize it. So I'm a big believer in in getting skin in the game for folks. How we do that in the the right way is tough. You know, if you're the guy who mows the grass uh, at the United States Department of Agriculture, you don't have a lot of ability to affect the national deficit. You can try to use a more efficient lawnmower or less efficient lawnmower. You can take fewer breaks and and, uh, and, and and work harder to avoid overtime so you don't run up the national deficit. But beyond that, you can't really do much. Uh, and so penalizing that guy 
because Congress and the President are making bad decisions, uh, that would be hard uh, for me to do. Now, have we overcompensated federal employees in general? I believe the answer is we have. Uh, and, and we have to go back, including uh, congressional uh, pensions, including the pension for that uh, guy who mows the grass, and so on and so on. We have to make sure that, that federal benefits are in line with private sector uh, benefits. Uh, back in the day when everybody uh, had a pension benefit, uh, it was right that the federal government had a pension benefit because we need to be able to compete with the private sector uh, for, for talented personnel. You know, we think about things like uh, the easiest uh, is computer security. Uh, you know, I want the very best computer security folks on the planet working for the American intelligence community. I want them protecting our energy uh, grid. I want them protecting our uh, our, our Defense Department uh, grid. I want them protecting everything. We can't get those guys for bargain basement discount uh, government prices. It takes top dollar to get top-notch talent like that, and I, I don't mind paying for that, that top-notch talent. It's that we ought to be paying market rates and we're not paying market rates in the government uh, today. We're compensating folks too much, uh, particularly given the, the value of their benefits package. Uh, government Reform and Oversight Committee has already begun uh, working uh, to look at those uh, packages and to see what it is uh, that, uh, that we can change and what it is that we can change uh, immediately that will start to have some, uh, some budget uh, impacts immediately. Uh, but going to the, the core of your point, uh, Mr. Brown, having skin in the game critically important. But I'll tell you this, and, and this is going to be hard for some people to hear. If you look at Congress and you don't like the way Congress operates, go back and look at the voters who elected them. And I, I, mean, that, uh, I mean that sincerely. Congress does respond to the voters. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where folks said, Rob, I want you to cut, 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 cut. We've got to get this budget balanced. We've got to make this happen. And then they'll follow me out to the parking lot after a meeting and say, and when I said cut, I meant you need to exempt these two or three programs because these two or three programs are really important to me. The, the, there are those self-interests uh, among the electorate. Uh, take look at uh, the race in uh, New York, uh, Charlie Rangel, former chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. We almost threw him out of Congress for unethical behavior, almost threw him out of Congress. But his constituency in New York reelected him overwhelmingly. Congress thought he wasn't qualified to be there at all. Folks in New York thought he was the very best person for the job. So uh, voters are, in fact, in charge of this country. Uh, and uh, if we empower them to make those, uh, make those decisions, I think we end up with the very best results. But will the federal government and its employees and, and congressmen and so on and so on be a part of the, uh, the solution? Absolutely. And I, I said during the campaign, and it's still – uh, still true uh, that I'm going to cut 10% uh, off of my own uh, budget because I think we ought to have those kind of 10% uh, cuts across the board. I think that's the only way to uh, to get started. We did implement a 5% across the board cut uh, for Congress, uh, but I don't think that went far enough, so I'm going to do in the other 5% uh, on my own. Uh, Operator, I think we've got time for uh, for one more question tonight. Connie Moss, your line is open. Good evening, uh, Mr. Woodall. Good evening. Uh, my question is, do you think that Medicare should continue to be cut, the budget should be cut? And my other question is, do you think the budget will be get, get balanced this year? Will, will they be, uh, be able to um, come to an agreement before uh, legislative is ended, before the spending is, is over with? The, uh, let me take that in, in three parts. Uh, will we get a balanced budget this year? The answer is absolutely not. The budget deficit this year is $1.4 trillion. The amount of money we spend on everything in the federal government that's not Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, interest on the national debt, and other mandatory spending is $1.4 trillion. In order to balance the budget tomorrow, we'd either have to double income taxes we'd have to cut absolutely everything, including Homeland Security, National Defense, courts, parks, the environment, transportation, everything, down to zero. Uh, that's how big the problem is. We, we're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar that we spend, and there is no way to cut out 40 cents overnight. 
but we can get started down that road, and we have to get started down that road. Does Medicare have to be part of the solution? Absolutely. It is the single fastest growing part of the federal budget. And to say it has to be part of the solution doesn't mean that we have to hurt beneficiaries. You know, everybody thinks Medicare keeps getting cut. Medicare beneficiaries haven't been cut at all. Medicare beneficiaries, since we started talking about Medicare reform in 1995, haven't been cut at all. It's the doctors and the hospitals that keep getting cut, which makes it harder for Medicare beneficiaries to find services. But the beneficiaries themselves aren't being cut. The one exception to that is the passage of the president's uh, health care bill. Uh, that health care bill, which was signed a year ago today, uh, actually cut the Medicare Advantage program out of Medicare altogether. That was a program that allowed seniors to, to make some choices about some extra benefits they might receive and some other benefits they might give up so that the package better reflected their health care needs. Uh, the president didn't like that program, and, and the bill uh, cut that program uh, out uh, entirely and, and took those health care plans away from seniors. But that's the first time that you've actually seen beneficiaries be cut. When we talk about Medicare cuts, we're talking about what's the best way to deliver health care. You know, it is. Medicare is an 80-20, old-fashioned, Blue Cross, Blue Shield system. And when I was three and four years old back in the early 70s, we had that kind of insurance in my family. I remember uh, folks talking about whether or not we could go to the doctor because we hadn't met our deductible and we were going to have to pay the copay and so on and so on. But during my working life, I've never had that kind of health care plan. During my working life, it's always been some sort of HMO, some sort of a preferred provider organization, some sort of medical savings account. It's been a completely different model. That old-fashioned Blue Cross Blue Shield model uh, uh, didn't exist in a way that made financial sense for me. That's what we're talking about when we talk about changing the way that, that Medicare works and making cuts uh, to Medicare, uh, Medicare budgets. We're not necessarily talking about cutting benefits. We're talking about cutting budgets. If we're spending $10,000 a year per Medicare beneficiary, what could you do with that $10,000 that would work better for you than what we're doing with it uh, on your uh, behalf? Uh, we keep clamping down on providers as the only way to save money in the Medicare system, and there is just no way uh, to keep providers in the system if we keep cutting them the way uh, that they have been uh, cut. The, the truth of the matter uh, is that uh, folks had no idea when they created the Medicare system how much it was going to cost. I, I remember the speech when Lyndon Johnson talked about uh, how much Medicare and Medicaid uh, would cost and, uh, over the next 10 years, and he underestimated it uh, by, by a factor of 10. Uh, we have to get people, and it goes back to uh, a question uh, someone asked earlier, we have to get people with skin in the game. And so we need to find a way to get Medicare beneficiaries involved in making their own health care choices, not just in terms of what they utilize, but the kinds of plans they utilize, and make them a beneficiary when they make good decisions and, and uh, ask them to pay a little more when they make uh, uh, bad, worse decisions or more expensive decisions. It pains me to say that. I just can't tell you how much it, it pains me to say that because I do not want the government, uh, government of the United States deciding for the American people what's a good decision and what's a bad decision, what's okay and what's not okay when it comes to health care decisions. I do not want that to happen. But if you're going to ask the federal government to provide your health care services for you, and that's what Medicare does, that's what you're always going to end up with. Call the comparative effectiveness panel, call the death panel, uh, call it uh, rationing based on dollars and cents, call it whatever you want to call it, but it always ends up with the government making decisions about your health for you. That's a dangerous, dangerous place for this country to be. We've got a lot of ideas on the table to move those decisions back uh, to seniors, to, to give folks in the 55 and under bracket some different choices for health care uh, when they hit, uh, hit retirement age, and I believe that's where we're going to find the, the dollars to completely overhaul uh, that system. But the question of is Medicare, uh, is reducing the Medicare budget going to be a, a part of the, of the budget solution? The answer is absolutely. It cannot happen without it, and Medicare will go bankrupt 
without it. So we, we owe it to everyone involved in Medicare uh, to get that right and, and make that possible. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, for uh, being here with me uh, tonight and uh, sharing in, in, in this discussion. Uh, again, if there were easy answers, they'd have been done already. The only things that are left for, for you and me are the really tough questions. And I believe we can make it happen. I believe we can can turn the corner on what just in the last three years has become a budget crisis that threatens the survival of our, our nation. We can absolutely turn that corner. But as I said at the very beginning, we've got four different budget conversations going on. We've got the CR uh, continuing resolution of battles going on. We've got the 2012 annual appropriations uh, discussions going on. We have the debt limit discussions going on, and we have the 10-year budget discussions going on. As you read uh, and uh, on the internet and in the newspapers and, and hear uh, information, uh, try to focus on which one of those four conversations uh, we're having. Uh, they're all coming up incredibly quickly, uh, and they all have a big, big impact uh, on what the financial future of, of America is. Um, I, I appreciate your, your willingness to engage on this, uh, confront these issues uh, with me. If you have any questions, uh, by all means, give my office a call. Let me give you our number. It's uh, here in, uh, in Gwinnett. It's 770-232-3005. Uh, and you're welcome to call uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely any time. And my email address is woodall, W-O-O-D-A-L-L, at mail.house.gov. Uh, your feedback, uh, you're sending me links to articles that you've read that, that are important to you. You're sending me that information that's coming across your desk that you think is important to me, it's incredibly appreciated. And so I urge you to continue uh, doing that if you already are and begin doing that if you, if you haven't already. And with that, I wish you all a, a fantastic uh, evening, and we will absolutely do this again uh, very, very soon. It's been tremendously uh, helpful to me, and I'm grateful. Thanks so much. Thank you for your participation. This concludes today's call. You may disconnect at this time.